Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And I'd like to welcome you to another of our series of Conservationists in Action. Today we're very fortunate to have John Cheney with us. He's a photographer and an author, and he's going to talk uh, a little bit about bald eagles. So thank you, John. You actually probably win the record for having traveled the farthest. <laughs> and begun your journey in Hawaii and, and ended up in West Virginia. I don't know if that's a... A progression or a regression. But we're glad to have you with us. Glad to be here today. Thank you. <laughs> and before we uh, start looking at your beautiful photographs, let me tell the audience a little about you. Uh, John Cheney's been interested in bald eagles since his college days uh, when he first learned they were on the verge of extinction. A few years later, the bald eagle was actually added to the Endangered Species Act and his passion grew year after year. Uh, his most recent uh, book, uh, highlighting these wonderful photographs of the bald eagle it is called 40 Years from the Brink of Extinction. It's a, it's a wonderful coffee table book uh, that I greatly enjoyed reading uh, with fascinating information about the bald eagle. Uh, he's been an avid photographer for half a century, for over 50 years. He's won a number of international awards. He's been in numerous publications. He had an award-winning image of an elephant mourning the death of its mate that was displayed in National Geographic, pretty much the epitome for photographers, uh, and received over 2 million visitors with 16,000 posts, resulted in over 20 interviews and publications as far away as Poland, Brazil, Italy, New Zealand, and West Virginia. <laughs> At 25, he was co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Telecheck Services in Houston, and for the next two decades, he led a team that built Telecheck into a national multi-hundred million dollar company. You have one of the most interesting backgrounds, John, of any uh, photographer or conservationist we've had out here. <laughs> In 2010, he retired uh, to certainly the less lucrative, but perhaps more uh, conservation certainly fulfilling more <laughs> career of, of uh, nearly full-time photographer. So, John, we're very happy to have you here with us. Well, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. <laughs> Appreciate that. And we thought a, a, a great way to begin, we don't want to hold the audience in suspense, you're a photographer, uh, probably the best way to begin is with some of your photographs and, and explanations of, of the bald eagle. Sure, I'd be glad to do that. Uh, what I'm going to share with you is uh, basically my journey of taking pictures of the bald eagle over the last 40 plus years, some of the anecdotal stories that uh, happened during the process. and. I am not a trained conservationist, so what I'm going to share are my personal observations uh, dealing with the American bald eagle. And th this story really starts off uh, as a freshman in uh, college. Mm -hmm. uh, I was an avid photographer in high school, uh, being the photo editor for the newspaper and the yearbook, and as I went off to college, I met a gentleman who basically changed my life. His name was Doc Wanamaker. And uh, what Doc uh, shared with me as the photography counselor for the, for the campus, he was also the biology uh, yeah. professor. And he and I became dear friends. And uh, it, it, through that, I had a, a shift in, uh, in my uh, philosophy about conservationists. Uh, my, my main uh, goal in going to college uh, was to get a business degree and enter into the business world. But when... Um, I, I, I had to take a biology course um, as part of the requirements to graduate, and I didn't want to do this. Uh, so I delayed it my freshman year, I delayed it my sophomore year, I delayed it my junior year, and finally spring semester of my junior year, I signed up for Biology 101, and sure enough, Doc Wanamaker, my <laughs> friend, was the, the professor. And I don't know if you ever have a professor like this, but one that is so passionate about their subject, so engaged in their subject, that you as a student just can't wait to get to class and learn what he's going to, to tell you each and every day. And he started every class off with an example of some species of an animal that had gone extinct during the lifetime of our brief 18 to 20 years that we've been on this earth. And he talked about that. And what he shared with us is that most of the species that were going extinct were going extinct because of what we, man, were doing to them. And it was a real um, uh, eye-opening experience from my perspective to understand that. And so he asked us to write our congressmen, write our senators, and there was a bill being discussed in the U.S. House and Senate 
about conservation. And so we would uh, uh, take a picture of some animal that had gone extinct, hand write the letter to our uh, senator and congressman, and this is before email, uh, before yeah. word processing, all that kind <laughs> of stuff. And this is when uh, your, your letters were read. Right. And uh, of the efforts that uh, our class and tens of thousands of other students, environmental and conservationists, did ended up creating the passage of the, Envir uh, the Endangered Species Act that was put into law in 1973. One of the things that I did learn about uh, while I was um, in this class was that the symbol of America, the uh, American bald eagle, according to Doc, was going to be extinct in the next decade. Um, it had been a, a, a bird of population of several hundred thousand in the 1800s. And uh, as a 20-year-old, I learned that there was less than 450 mating pairs left in the lower 48. Yeah. And I, I learned that the uh, bald eagle, uh, that almost all of its troubles in survival was again created by us. Uh, there were probably three distinct areas of, of harm that was happening. Uh, first was hunting uh, from 1917 to 1953. Uh, the, um, the territory of Alaska felt that the eagle was taking away the salmon f uh, fishing industry. And so they put a bounty on bald eagles of anywhere from 50 cents to $1.50 for a pair of talons. And uh, during that time period, more than 100,000 bald eagles were killed uh, through a hunting process. Uh, the second and probably the most devastating was DDT. Uh, it entered the food supply of the, of the uh, rodents, and as the eagle would eat the rodents, uh, it uh, messed with the reproductive process of the bald eagle. The eagle would lay its eggs, but they were so thin-shelled that they couldn't go to maturity, and so there was no offspring coming yeah. from them. And the third area was uh, what we were doing in the logging industry, the clear-cutting of uh, the... Um, the trees and taking down the massive nests that the eagles build and return to year after year. John, I got to interrupt a second. Yeah. Uh, the archive where I took you earlier. Yes. We have these, and you explain why we have these necklaces of bald eagle talons. <laughs> yes. I've always wondered what in heaven's name are these, and they must go back to the bounty system. They, they uh, do. Yeah. They I mean, do. they just they're they're ghoulish things, and then of course the DDT thing. Um, Rachel Carson worked for us for 16 years for Fish and Wildlife Service, so we have a whole bunch of records of, of hers, including her library. So, thank you for bringing that up. Oh, <laughs> glad to do. We don't that. have any connection to the deforestation. <laughs> well, one of the things that I, I think um, I learned early on in, in college was to to have a passion for um, what you're doing. It 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 is a it's a wonderful uh, uh, when when you take something past a job, take something past a, uh, you're, you're just doing it for fun and have a passion about it, you really can get into it. And my, my story again goes back to Doc Wanamaker. I was on the bluffs of the Mississippi River mm -hmm. and I saw an eagle flying up and down the uh, Mississippi River and I ran to tell Doc about it. I didn't have my camera with me at the time. I ran to tell Doc about it. He didn't believe me because it's one of the 450 <laughs> pairs that uh, uh, were in the uh, the U.S., but after I described it with him, uh, he said, yes, I had indeed seen an eagle, and we spent the next two hours uh, talking. It's one of those times where you have a light bulb go off, an aha moment in life, and I had always viewed photography as a means to an end. It was, uh, it was my job. Uh, I was taking pictures of po sports teams. I was taking pictures of uh, dress rehearsals of the drama department, and that's how I paid for my expenses in college. But he he tried to get me to see that it could be a, much more than simply uh, a hobby or a job. It could be something meaningful, that if I could take a picture that would start a conversation mm -hmm. about something that was endangered or something that was going to be harmed, that I would be able to do something a lot more important with my, my skill as a photographer. So it, it became a passion of mine at that point. Um, and it brought a lot of joy, a lot of excitement, a lot of fulfillment in my life. And I spent the next, uh, uh, I guess, 45, 50 years 
uh, tracking down endangered species, not only eagles but others, to try to capture them on film. Uh, I went back to that bluff on the Mississippi River time and time again to no avail uh, <laughs> to, to find a, a picture of a bald eagle, yeah. but I couldn't do it. In fact, my first picture of a bald eagle occurred almost seven years later. Uh, it was in the um, late 1970s, and I was able to get this picture of a bald eagle. It's not the best photograph in the world, but it, it's meaningful to me because it was the very first time I captured on film a bald eagle in flight, and it happened to have some uh, salmon uh, yeah. in, its, in its talons at the time. So the Alaskans were right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but the way I, I, I joined the business world, I did not become a professional photographer. I joined the business world, but every time my business would take me to a part where there might be an opportunity uh, to photograph something unique and different, I would tack a day onto my business trip and spend the time looking for it. And as we were, were looking for these bald eagles, uh, I had a lot of false attempts. Uh, I, would, I knew that a bald eagle would be near a source of water, yeah. whether that be a river or a lake, um, and I'd go and I might hear a bald eagle but never see it. Or I might see a bald eagle but it's so far away I couldn't get a good grasp of it, I couldn't get to it, and in this image here, uh, this is exactly what happened on this day. I could hear this bald eagle. Yeah. And it happened to be uh, sitting in the trees in the lower right-hand corner of the image, and finally it took off. I was able to get it nicely framed in the, in the sky between the two mountains. Um, the, um, what I saw during the first probably 20 years of my journey of taking pictures of the bald eagle is I'd find a single bald eagle. Uh, there, there were, you know, where there should be a lot of prevalence uh, because the natural, natural environment is good, yeah. I wouldn't see them, but I might see one. And so they were very lonely and they, there wouldn't be another one for miles. Did people help you find them? Did, did you ask it was people? Work, it was, there was no internet, uh, there was no yeah. search guide on this, uh, so it was word of mouth. Um, I became friends with the... Um, uh, the gentleman who ran the Houston Zoo, he introduced me to other people that were uh, the, the heads of zoos around the yeah. country. They had clues as to where I might go. And so if, if I ended up having a trip up to uh, Vancouver, mm -hmm. uh, I, I knew that if I went into the Fraser Valley, I might be able to find sure. something. So that, that's how all this, uh, uh, this journey uh, took place. Um, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the bald eagle is, uh, can live a long time if we don't mess it up. Uh, they have a lifespan of 30-plus uh, years uh, out in the wild, maybe 35-plus more in, uh, in captivity. And I, I, my first time I got close to a bald eagle uh, was on this shot of the one sitting on the, uh, this rock of snow here. And I was kind of excited because I was relatively close. It was a yeah. snowy day, cold day. I was up in the Alaskan area. Uh, sunlight was relatively uh, uh, minimal. Sunrise, 8.30 to 9.30 in the morning. Sunset, 3.30 or so in the mm -hmm. afternoon. And I found this guy about 11 in the morning. And I'm saying, okay, I'm going to get my first shot of an eagle up close in flight. So I set up all my gear and I watched. And he looked at me and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I looked at him. And eagles only fly 20, 30, 40 minutes a day. And he outlasted me. He <laughs> stayed in that position through the entire day uh, and this never took shot. off. <laughs> this one makes up for it, this next shot. Yeah. But by the uh, early 1990s, uh, a lot of things had happened. Uh, the eagles were starting to be more plentiful. Uh, but Equally important from my perspective as a photographer, photography had radically changed. Yeah. Cameras were getting better. Lenses were getting longer. Film was getting higher speed so you could take pictures later into the evening. So it was uh, delightful to be able to get up close uh, to the photographer, get cl up close to the, to the eagles with the uh, better equipment uh, that was out there. Now this picture is the cover of your coffee table book. It is. How did, it, how did you pick 
this particular image to be the cover of the book? Uh, to be honest, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave a handful of images uh, uh -huh. to the publisher of the book. Uh, the book uh, came about as a contest that uh, I had entered at PhotoFest, okay. and I won the uh, uh, contest, and, a, and I got the right to have my first book published with that. But I gave them four or five images, and they wanted to have something that would be able to hold the title real well, and so they were able to put the title above the wings, and that's how that, <laughs> yeah, that the, came about. the wings kind of encapsulate that's right. the uh, title. I, yeah. I love it. Well, uh, the... the uh, the eagles are just a, a magnificent bird. They're also wonderful, great hunters. Uh, when when I in the, I, I, I'll have to break this kind of the first twenty years and the second twenty uh -huh. years. In the first twenty years, when an eagle would make a catch uh, and bring it back to the shore, it was absolutely normal to see that eagle go off to see if there's a better prey elsewhere. And they'd come back to the same catch and there'd be no disturbance to it. They could eat at their leisure. And so this is one of those earlier pictures where this eagle had made the catch probably 20 or 30 minutes before, is now coming back to the salmon that's, that's on the shoreline waiting for it. Uh, I was blessed with this headshot of an eagle. Uh, I'm on the uh, riverbank uh, and this eagle lands on a log fairly close by. I turn my camera, take a couple of shots, and uh, the eagle's looking at me. I'm looking at him. And yeah, then, I was going to say. <laughs> then it uh, takes off. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it was delightful to see such a beautiful, strong, regal image uh, up close like that. This next uh, eagle shot is uh, one up, obviously, right after a snowstorm. I had uh, rented a little cabin that was uh, very near where I thought we'd be uh, have a lot of eagle activity. And uh, I knew we were going to have a snowstorm that evening. Uh, but I didn't have any uh, expectation of how bad a snowstorm it was going to be. So by the time I got in there early afternoon, I was going to go into town for dinner. And I opened up the door. It looked like a pretty bad uh, snowstorm. So I said, OK, I'll just stay in. I had a box of Oreos with me, and <laughs> that became dinner. Uh, the next morning when I got up, I opened the door. The, the snow was basically chest deep on the door, and uh, I was basically snowbound. So the, uh, my breakfast and lunch that day were that same <laughs> bag of Oreos. But uh, early afternoon came by, and uh, the snowplow was able to get me out of the mess. And as I'm driving out to see if I can get a couple of more shots before the sun would go down, that's when I saw this guy uh, along the road there. With the, so there was probably, I don't know, three and a half, four feet of snow yeah. that particular day. <laughs> um, w when, you're, when you're tracking eagles, you're typically very, very remote. Uh, they're not uh, uh, around a, a normal environment. And uh, I've, I've got the, the shot of this eagle I saw standing uh, very near the road's edge. The, um, the road was on a, it's a small two-lane asphalt highway, but there was a fairly steep decline going down to the river's edge. So I carefully pull off with two wheels on the asphalt, two wheels on the, uh, on the dirt, get my camera gear out, not knowing if this eagle is going to stay there or not. Right. But it did. I got a couple of shots. I was able to get uh, some interior shots of the mouth and yeah. the tongue, which I'd never seen <laughs> I've before. I've never seen that before either. Um, and I was Great glad shot. about that. Put my camera gear away, and as I'm getting ready to leave, uh, the the downward wheel caught, and it spun, and it pulled the car off the road. <laughs> and now I'm in a freeform slide all the way down towards the river. Fortunately, a boulder stopped me from going in. Oh, no. And I'm going, okay, I'd been there taking pictures of this eagle for about an hour. Not a single car had gone by. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm spending my night here in the car. <laughs> uh, but a truck came by about 45 minutes later uh, we hooked up a chain to the front of the car and as try as hard as he could he couldn't get me out uh, but he was willing to take me into town so we could get a tow truck but while we were transferring my gear into the truck a school bus of high school kids came by <laughs> they had a chain they hooked it to the other side of my car the kids all got out they pushed and the truck oh, and the bus together got me back on the road so <laughs> oh, I ended up having a, uh, a way home in my car that yeah. I had rented for the day <laughs> Um, eagles are pretty big. Um, uh, their, their, their wingspan is six to seven feet. 
they can typically fly comfortably at 10,000 feet. Uh, they fly at about 35 miles an hour, much faster when they're going into a dive, but mm -hmm. they're, they're uh, a pretty good size, uh, size bird. And when you look at them up close, uh, the female is a little bit bigger than the male. Uh, the female is 36, 37 inches in height. Um, and there's a, a funny story I was told uh, by the folks at the uh, Bald Eagle Foundation. Uh, they, they take uh, eagles that have been harmed, a broken wing, a broken right. leg, and they try to repair them and introduce them back into the wild. And they got an eagle, which they were told was a male eagle. Uh, they put it in the uh, area with all the uh, other male eagles. Mm -hmm. And there was, a, uh, there was some strange behaviors going on. And they found out that the male eagle was really a female eagle. There's no <laughs> visible way to determine a male or female. They did a DNA test uh, to determine. <laughs> then they properly put it in the correct oh, yeah. cage going forward uh, for the rest of its rehabilitation time. So were you able to sex them for your photographs, or you just had to, to guess? I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. It's a total guess. I had no way of, of knowing uh, yeah. if it was a male or a female. So if I'm calling it a female or a male, that's, <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, the, uh, I mentioned earlier on that the logging industry was um, uh, partially to blame for some of the yeah. demise of the eagle. These eagle nests are rather large, uh, two to 4,000 pounds wow. in size. Um, uh, the, the, the mating pair will come back year after year. They'll lay two to three eggs. Uh, hopefully all of them will fledge and mm -hmm. uh, uh, become uh, eaglets and uh, uh, you'll, you'll end up with the uh, uh, some more eagles into the population. Uh, and what's interesting about uh, the eagles is that both the male and the female share equal duty. Uh, raising the young, sitting with the nest, uh, training the eagles, they, they do it together as a pair. And it takes about 12 weeks uh, before they, uh, they go off. But if the logging industry takes down a tree with a nest, that pair that may mate for 20 years will stop having eggs. Really? And they won't go forward with any more. And they typically won't build a second nest. And when the nest is unused by the current mating pair after 20 years or so, mm -hmm. another pair will find it and take over that nest. So when you lose an eagle nest, it's not only losing it for the current generation, but for future generations as well. I hadn't realized that. Any idea why their nests are so huge? I mean, uh, I have no idea why they're so huge. Because <laughs> they're, they're, we have one in our sycamore, and it's, it's the same thing. It's gigantic. Yeah, right? it's it, and sometimes uh, the the new nesting pair will add to it. Yeah. Uh, but it's a massive nest, uh, so that uh, I, I I honestly don't know why they're so big, but they're they're big. You need a large tree to hold. Yes, it. you do. <laughs> yes, you do. Now, I've been showing pictures uh, of eagles that I thought was the way, only way eagles would look. It's the yeah. beautiful white head, uh, the yellow beak, the beautiful white tail, the rich black feathers. And yet, uh, here's a picture of a bald mm -hmm. eagle uh, that is nothing like that at all. And uh, I, I learned that this is a juvenile eagle, yeah. uh, that the, the color that we're used to, the color that we see in, in all the symbols of America, is really a mature eagle somewhere around the fifth year. Um, the eagle when they're born are basically all brown and they will have a blue beak. Wow. Um, and somewhere during the first year that blue beak will turn yellow. <laughs> and then somewhere in the second and third year there'll be a lot of under feathering of the wings that are very white uh, and the, the brown start to go away and then they eventually go darker and then the head will be kind of a black and white head for a while, and then it'll eventually, around the fourth to fifth year, turn pure white. So it's a, it's an interesting uh, process yeah. of go, that they go through. Um, this, this is a, a great a, action shot. Yeah, this is a great action <laughs> shot of a uh, of an eagle uh, catching a salmon, and it actually caught the salmon much further out in the river. An eagle weighs, oh, 10 to 14 pounds. Uh, with its ability, it can lift about a four pound weight uh, of its prey. 
And this particular eagle, which because of the coloring of the head is probably about a four-year-old eagle, could not lift that salmon out of the water. So it, it scooted it all the way across the river with that uh, salmon splashing in the process to get into the shallows where it could put its weight down on the sa shallow and release the claws. Those claws need a little bit of pressure to, yeah. to get the release. So if a salmon has, uh, I mean if an eagle has eyes too big for its belly so to speak and it captures a six pound salmon in deep water, it's not only a bad day for the salmon, it's a bad day for the eagle as well. Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, it's an interesting process yeah. to watch them go through that. Um, I have spent my lifetime uh, looking at these eagles and taking pictures and I have always been a champion of the bald eagle, except once. And one time I was rooting for the prey. Uh, and this is a picture of that happened. And by the way, the pictures up there that you're looking at, you can actually see a lot of the uh, white feathers on the under part of the wings that yeah. are coming into play as it's going through its uh, uh, path into to, uh, becoming a full-fledged mature eagle. But this uh, juvenile eagle was diving down, going after the six little ducklings of this mother duck. And as the eagle would get close, the mother duck would wave, put her wings straight up in the air, squawk, and the little ducklings would dive under the water, and so the eagle wouldn't have a chance to get them. And then as soon as the eagle went overhead, she would swim as fast as she could have to the, to the shoreline with her du baby ducks, and it would happen all over again. This was about a 30, 35 different attempts to steal oh a baby duck. Fortunately, all the ducks made it over to the, <laughs> the green reeds on the side of the road, on the side of the river. There. That would have been a good time to have a video camera. <laughs> yeah. well, it would have been a great video there. Um, uh, the eagle eye, uh, and, and we, we hear the term eagle eye, yeah. uh, there, there's a reason for that. They're really amazing eyes. Uh, they're quite, there's a large pupil for the size of the, the eagle. Um, there's over a million light sensitive uh, cells per millimeter, square millimeter of the retina. And that's five times more than we as humans have. Uh, they see wow. in five primary colors, we see in three primary colors. And they have probably the best sight of any animal in the animal kingdom. Uh, they're able to spot a rodent that's in camouflage up to a couple of miles away. My God. Uh, they, they're just, eyesight is phenomenal. How close were you to get this, that particular picture? I was very close. Uh, <laughs> it looks uh, like I had a, uh, technically I had an 800 millimeter lens uh -huh. and I was focused as close as I could and there was an eagle that was pretty close to me that I was able to get just a full headshot of that, of uh, that image. Um, the other thing that uh, I've, I thought there was something wrong with my, my camera. I would be taking pictures of an eagle and I'd see this blurriness over an eye. In a good photograph, the eye's gotta be sharp. Mm -hmm. And then I learned that the eagle has a, an inner eyelid that's clear that would go across the eye to wipe away the dirt and the uh -huh. debris, allowing the uh, eagle to be able to see even when it's blinking uh, in flight. So here's an example of yeah. uh, one with the eye clear and one with the, uh, uh, the membrane across it. That's great. We move up to into the, uh, the 1990s um, and we're starting to see more eagles together mm -hmm. uh, in this particular tree. There's a couple nest, uh, in the tree and then one landing on the tree, which is great to, to start to see them coming back. And I start to see eagles in pairs, and, yeah. which is great to see. Um, and they, the eagles do, as I mentioned earlier, mate for life. But if by chance one uh, passes, uh, they do find another mate to continue with the process. Up in Fraser Valley, they told the story of one that had unfortunately been killed by a car. And within three days, uh, the eagle had another one in the nest helping him or her with the, the rest of the nesting yeah. duties. Um, and I, I found these eagles sitting up in a tree and they, they were very calm, very peaceful, just turning their head left and right. And then all of a sudden, this one comes out of the tree and I'm, I'm between the branch and the river. And so apparently this eagle had seen something in the river that would attract the attention. 
and I thought it was coming after me, and I'd never been attacked by an eagle before, but it's coming straight at me, yeah. and it actually <laughs> took my hat off as it's going overhead, uh, <laughs> as it's in its route to, to get to uh, uh, some, some fish, obviously. Yeah, you were between it and dinner. Yeah, I was between <laughs> it and dinner. By the time we get into the, uh, the early 2000s, uh, the, the, the fate of the eagle had reversed itself. And it had gone from being on the endangered species list to being classified as threatened. Mm -hmm. And then in 2005, we're blessed to see that it came off the endangered species list, which is just a, a wonderful um, uh, story of success. One of the things that I didn't experience early on in my journey is what's called a kettle. Mm -hmm. uh, when eagles all go up in the sky together, it, it, it's called a kettle. And I don't know what starts it. I've only seen it three times in my lifetime. Every eagle that was in the water, every eagle that was in a tree, every eagle that was around, all go up in the sky at the same time together, and they're all squawking. It's, it's um, uh, I, I'd like to say that the sound feels like you're at a sporting event, a, a, a professional basketball game, a professional football game, the noise level that's going on. What doing. Uh, I have no idea what they're yeah. doing, and it doesn't last long. Uh, three, four, five minutes, and they settle back down again, and it won't repeat itself, uh, I mean, that day. Yeah. Uh, but something has obviously spooked them, and they're all up in the, up in the air at the same time. Now, rumor has it uh, that during the uh, American Revolution, that uh, during one of the big battles, uh, there was a kettle of eagles overhead of the American of the re of Revolution, and the noise was so deafening that the American soldiers thought that this all-American bird, this North American bird, was screaming for the freedom for America. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, it as the rumor continues to go, that George Washington wanted the bald eagle to be the symbol of America. Uh, fighting against uh, his friend Ben Franklin who yeah. wanted the turkey, <laughs> turkey. <laughs> because as Ben Franklin said, eagles are just a bunch of scavengers. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I had not witnessed any of that at that point in time, but as the population comes back, I start to witness this period of scavengerism, if you will. Yeah. Um, when one eagle catches a fish, another eagle is going to try to come in and take it away. And uh, you, you get a sense of why, why Ben Franklin was saying they were a bunch of scavengers. Um, I witnessed something last year that I'd never seen before, which is a eagle doing a somersault. Yeah. There was a salmon in the water. This water is real shallow, probably four to six inches deep. Uh, and I was tracking the eagle that was flying. And as this eagle came in, the other eagle that was in the water did a full somersault to protect its uh, <laughs> fish that it had. Did it work? It, it, did, it, did, <laughs> it drove the other one away. And here's another example of an eagle coming in trying wow. to take the, uh, the fish away. One last story about the eagles. Uh, uh, I had uh, uh, saw an eagle up in a tree and I was with my son Peter on a, a kind of a father-son trip. Uh, and I had watched it for several hours and just sitting up there and it took flight. The light was perfect, the, the, the fall colors on the shoreline was perfect, and so I'm taking pictures and I'm just thrilled. This is, you know, you wait for, as a photographer, right. for the right light, the right moment. Peter's going, Dad, Dad, you gotta see this. And I'm taking, no, not now, Peter, I've got the eagle. It's only gonna fly for a minute. Dad, Dad, you gotta see this. And I'm taking pictures. Dad, you gotta see this. So I turn around and a bear had jumped in the oh. water. Right beside the boat, it was eating a salmon about 15 feet away. And I was so engrossed with the eagle, I didn't even know a bear was in the water. Uh, this last picture I'm going to show of the eagles is what I call the recovery. Wow. Uh, there are 37 eagles in this one little still frame picture. And it's a really happy story. Uh, here, 40 years later, uh, in this one image, uh, we've got about 5% of the population of eagles that were around in North America when I started my journey. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to see them come back. And we've made a big difference. Uh, what we do as a society makes a difference. And we've got a happy story with the eagle. 
Uh, we've got a happy story with the American alligator. We've got a happy story with the grizzly bear. Yep. We've got a happy story with the gray wolf. These are all wonderful uh, examples of species that have been put on the endangered list and through concerted efforts they've been able to come back strong and healthy. But there's bad news out there. Um, I, I, I want to make sure I get the, the number right. Um, I just looked it up. There's 16,306 species on the endangered species list and that's up 188 from last year. In one year, we've added 188. Now, the, the law passed in 1973. From 1973 to today, we have not had 188 successful stories. So we've got to do a lot more in this process. And my part in this is one of trying to build a conversation around it, try to find things that we can change and illustrate that from a photographic perspective and anyone who wants to have copies of my images for research that they're doing, for books that they're writing, uh, it's free to them to do so. I've got four more images that are not of the eagle, if I could share those please, for just a please. second. Um, I know they're going to be good. <laughs> uh, I've, I've made uh, about a uh, dozen trips over to Africa. And one of the species that I know that is near extinction is the black rhino. There's yeah. less than 1,800 of them left. Um, and every time I would get close to a black rhino, it would recognize a Range Rover or a human, and rightly so, it would run, yeah. because we are hunting them to death. Um, a black rhino horn in the Asian market sells for about $750,000. Wow. So we're looking at, in this picture, about a million and a half dollars worth of raw horn. Uh, the poacher who takes this raw horn gets about $20,000. And that's when the annual income of the area is about $500 a year. Uh, it, it, it's just a terribly sad circumstance. And I don't think I would have been able to get this picture of the two black rhinos had it not been their interest in each other. Uh, it was a dance. I've never seen two uh, animals dance like this. It was. It's very reminiscent of fencing. Um, one would charge and they'd cross horns and then they would back up and then they would kick their feet up and the other would charge and they'd cross horns and they kept doing this dance back and forth. I'm sure trying to figure out who is the stronger, the most yeah. macho in the process. But once they realized I was there, that stopped immediately and they just took off to the underbrush. Uh, but it, they were distracted short enough period of time that I was able to get that it's a picture. great shot. I've got another picture of the humpback whale. Uh, we have, uh, we almost lost this species again through hunting and fortunately so many countries have now signed treaties yeah. not to hunt the whale that they have come back and they've come back relatively strong. And we've seen pictures of a whale tail, we've seen pictures of a whale breach uh, out of the water I spent the last two months, of, or the first two months of this year, uh, photographing whales via a drone to get overhead to see the behavior that's happening under the water. And what I found was I always thought that the whale was breaching because it was trying to show off for the female to get their attention. But with what I was watching in the drone photography that is that 20, 30, 40 feet below the water, two males are going after each other and one is jumping out of the water to get out of the way of the other one that's trying to hit it. And so in this particular picture, uh, the male has uh, survived and chased off all the other suitors and is now left alone with the female and about 15, 20 feet below the surface is blowing a ring of bubbles in a very courtship-like way around the female and then they're uh, going to dive together to have their courtship uh, opportunity. It's a great image. Um, global warming is obviously uh, an issue that is uh, changing the landscape of where many Arctic animals, whether it's a polar bear having less uh, territory to hunt or the penguins down in uh, the South Pole area, 
it is changing dynamically what's happening down there. The population is still strong, but it's declining. Yeah. And unless we do something about that, it's, it's going to be a disaster for these species. And here's, I've got uh, uh, three little guys on their way home after a day of hunting uh, to take the food back to their, their, their young. I'm going to end with a picture that you uh, talked about uh, in the introduction. And I hope I can get through this without uh, uh, getting too emotional about it. But uh, um, it was a, one of those moments in nature that just, just brings the human side to light. Um, we'd come across a, um, a deceased elephant. It was not killed by poachers. The tusks were still in intact. Uh, but there were, it was covered in vultures. There were several hyenas on the, um, on the, the, the elephant. And the, uh, the female elephant uh, comes in, uh, screeching her noise, chasing away the vultures, goes all the way around the, the elephant, and then very carefully with her trunk, drags it over the head, around the body, and then goes to the front of the elephant and then very slowly wraps the trunk around the tusks and just stays there and just is like saying goodbye, old friend. And it was just a touching moment. There wasn't a dry eye in the Range Rover when we were th there together. And trying to humanize the behavior of the different species that we have in this world, trying to cr show the beauty of the species, that's what I'm trying to do uh, in sharing these images uh, that I have. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for Doc Wanamaker who convinced me to go from being a photographer to being a nature photographer. <laughs> that was a great show, John. That was superb, and I really like the elephant one at the end. That's one of our big pushes now is to try to wipe out the trade in illegal ivory. Yes, yeah. Now they're in danger <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> increasingly. Let me ask you just a couple questions sure. that, that came up as I was looking at those photographs. Um, how did you train yourself to be a photographer? Self-taught. All self-taught. All yeah. self-taught. Um, I'm a little bit of a techie uh, person. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I love the technology uh, that uh, cameras have. Uh, as my business career flourished, I was able to afford uh, uh, more camera gear. And uh, in the uh, mid-1990s, I bought a new house. And one of the things I wanted to have was a color darkroom. Not a black and white, but a color darkroom. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so I built that. And in the late 1990s, digital photography was happening. <laughs> I know, I know. And I'm, I'm a first adopter. And so I never developed anything in that dark room <laughs> of mine. I ended up giving all the equipment away to a school. But the, uh, I, I read a lot of books. Uh, I experimented. Uh, so everything was self-taught. There wasn't any course that I went to on that. Because you kind of chose a challenging subject. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Eagles. It is, I mean, it is they were, a... Uh, they're rare. They're, they're in flight. I, I mean... I have, <laughs> a, I have a lot of images, tens of thousands of images that would not make this presentation <laughs> of the mistakes I made. And once you learn, uh, okay, I know I got to do a little bit faster shutter speed because the wings are blurred yeah. or uh, I need to have a little bit faster film because it's too dark. Uh, uh, you make a lot of mistakes and once you make the mistakes, you learn. Just don't make the same mistake yeah. twice. <laughs> Did you ever use blinds uh, no. to get shots? No. I, I never found that the eagle was fearful yeah. of man. Uh, they, 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 they were high in a tree. Uh, we never, uh, they never sensed danger, so they would never fly away as I was approached. I approach quietly. I, you yeah. know, don't honk the horn and that kind of stuff. <laughs> right, but right. I could park a car and. Uh, grab my tripod and uh, walk through the the brush, and uh, the eagle that was there was still there when I got there. It's the advantage of having a top predator, <laughs> <laughs> top, head of the food chain. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned the the story about the uh, grizzly bear behind uh, when you were shooting the eagle. Did you shoot other wildlife shots? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've I've uh, tracked the polar bears up in uh, the you know the northern parts of Canada. The uh, the, the bears through uh, Alaska, um, been to the Galapagos Islands, been to Africa, been to all seven continents, and uh, uh, take the typical shots that you do on a vacation. Right. But the shots that mean something to me is, is like the, the ones of the black rhino, where 
although I got my nice pictures of the lions and the leopards right. uh, that were there, and I'm happy with those, the black rhino picture was much more meaningful to me on this last trip because it is such a rare animal and one that hopefully uh, someone will take that image and do something with it uh, to continue the education process of they're not good aphrodisiacs, they don't no. cure cancer, they don't no. do those things at all, but the Asian market seems to believe that and uh, paying top dollar for those horns. Yeah. Well, that goes back to something you said, and it's in the book, too. I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of times you hope your photographs start a conversation. Um, but how does it go from conversation to, to conservation, to actually protecting these? As somebody who's been in the field for almost it, 50 it years. Is, um, it's not a one-person job by any means. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a community that works together. Um, the uh, area that uh, I, I, I talked about going to in Haines, Alaska, uh, they've been able to segment probably two and a half, three miles of a road along the Chilkat River as a bald eagle preserve. Uh, which is great, uh, and uh, uh, if 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 we all work together, um, environmentalists, conservationists, lawmakers, citizens, uh, we can recognize that we have a species that's being harmed, mm -hmm. and do something about it rather than just let it take its course. And what really gets me mad is yes. Things happen in nature that cause a species to go away. But when we, man, are the culprit, right. we can change. Um, at, at, at lunch today, uh, we were talking about uh, subdivisions coming out to this part of, the, of your area. Yeah. And there are a number of nests along the Potomac out here. Sure. And as they're developing houses, Yes, they, they can develop houses, but leave the trees with the nests where they are because not only will that generation not go on, but the next generation won't come back to that tree and that nest. As you explained very well <laughs> during yeah. the presentation. Now, you have one of the most interesting resumes of <laughs> anybody we've had out here. First question I have is, did you ever consider becoming a photographer full-time? I did. Um, <laughs> And I'm sorry to say I'm too materialistic. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, I uh, went down the business world path. Um, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. Uh, my dad started a business when I was young. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to start a business as well. And I did so when I was uh, 26 years old. And that provided the, uh, the family wealth that allowed me to do the kind of things that I wanted to do in photography. But I did seriously look at becoming a photographer, but I, 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 photographers to make a living had to be a wedding photographer or a school photographer to, to draw a salary. Yeah. And what I found a passion for was nature photography. Yeah. And there was not a big market for nature photographs. And so I kept that as a passion, as a love, but income came from the business side of my life, not the photography side of my sure. life. Did they overlap in any way? I mean, you did mention business trips and so on, but did the, you? The business trips helped. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, if I had a, uh, a trip to Maine or I had mm -hmm. a trip up into uh, the, the Pacific Northwest, uh, I was able to tack on a day or two either before or after uh, to go and uh, do some nature photography, so that 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 worked out very well. Yeah, did you toy with the idea of making the eagle the symbol of your company? Or no, no, like no, that? I did, did not. Your passion. <laughs> no. But it does raise an interesting question. People often don't think of businessmen as being conservationists, but clearly, you are. You're passionate. Um, you're very committed to it. In in your field and, and folks you worked with, did you find other folks that were passionate about the environment and nature? I have found a few. Uh, it's not a large percentage by any means, yeah. but uh, when, uh, when I retired in 2010, I had been a, uh, probably a workaholic, you know, the 60-hour the work week, sure. uh, running fairly significant company, um, and I started spending all of my time uh, 
doing photography and I would take more photography trips and uh, try to have exhibitions of my work and most of my colleagues and friends had no idea that that this was another side of me yeah. uh, and uh, uh, they've kind of gotten into it now and they, you know they I'll, I'll make up a calendar at the end of a year with uh -huh. their nature photographs and pass that out as holiday gifts and that kind of stuff and but they didn't know anything about that during my 40-year business career that's one other interesting question you've been doing photography for a long time what's the most important technological change as regards your photographs there have been a lot. Anyway. There's been a lot. Which ones um, impacted you? I'm asking as a non-photographer, but somebody interested in technology. Maybe. The the quality that digital has brought uh, is probably the most significant uh, advantage. Um, film was pretty good, mm -hmm. but you had to have the right amount of light. Um, and so as the, as the sun was setting, uh, you were basically out of work as a photographer because there was not enough light yeah. uh, to capture an image correctly. Now they've really increased the speed. The detail that can be captured on digital is greater than the grain that used to be prevalent in film. So digital is probably the single biggest thing. The camera bodies have gotten so much better. And they upgrade kind of about every three or four years they get cheaper and better yeah. uh, like all technology has lenses have gotten a little bit better but for the most part it's the the camera bodies that uh, have really been improved i'm not going to ask what camera you use because from what you've said before i'm sure you use lots of cameras i do <laughs> but I what's do. your favorite camera i can ask uh, the other child <laughs> uh, it depends on what i'm trying to do I shoot basically two different kinds of photography. One is uh, landscape photography. The scene is not moving. Mm -hmm. And in the old days, you'd use a four by five view camera where you'd uh, carry up, put the, the, the cloth over your head, yeah. but you get a great big image. I use a medium format camera for that. And that's, it's called a phase one. Mm -hmm. uh, and it gets beautiful landscape image, but it's not fast enough or light enough for wildlife. So for light, for uh, wildlife, I'm using a, uh, a Canon camera with a, a very long lens attached to it. We're just about out of time. This went so fast. <laughs> Thanks to your images, but I, I have to ask, obviously eagles were your passion, and they've been for four decades. Um, what are you going to focus on now? Is there, what will be, and, and maybe even more general if you haven't Decide maybe not another species, but are you really interested now in international wildlife or, or other domestic wildlife or uh, endangered species? What I'm I'm in I'm interested in species that are endangered, uh, because if we can get a uh, get those images out, hopefully, it will arouse enough interest to do something to help protect them. Uh, so if I if I do another book, it's probably going to be on something that is endangered. Uh, I really was not planning on doing a book on eagles, but uh, some friends encouraged me to go through my archive and pull together some images and enter a contest, and I won, uh, which is which is great. Um, what's next? I, I don't know that I've got a, a course of action. I know my wife's got a direction for me to go. Uh, she's interested in me doing something on the whales because I've yeah. I've been doing that for twenty some odd years. Uh, and uh, having a home in Hawaii is, uh, there's a lot of activity with yeah. whales over there. Well, there's a lot of endangered species in Hawaii. There are. There <laughs> we are. We're working with many of them. We'd, we'd love to see you photograph some of those. What, whatever you do, we hope you'll come back and visit us again. This was inspirational. Your passion comes through along with your expertise. And, John, I can't thank you enough for, for doing this. Thank you well, very much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, we want to thank all of you for tuning in. And uh, in September, we'll have a guest out here talking about the connection between uh, Rachel Carson and Beatrix Potter. So that should be interesting. Thank you very much.